Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dor and today we're doing a personality type unboxing. We're doing my personality type unboxing. We're talking about my personality type. Yeah, the time has come. As you might know, last year my personality type came under heavy fire online. That meant varied varieties of organizations all came out and publicly accused me of being a different personality type than the type I thought I was. That meant people came out and said I'm an ISFJ, an ESFP, an ENFP, an ENTP or some other form of personality type. Everyone thought I was another personality type than the type I said I was. Standing before all these different organizations, I found myself carrying a degree of imposter syndrome. Hearing all these people accuse me of being a fraud, of being wrong, of being incorrect about my very own self, I felt I had no more merit to stand on my own legs. Who am I to say that I know myself better than any of these people? Who am I to stand up and say that I know myself and that I know who I am? I thought at that point that the best course of action would be to just remove my type label. I know that no matter what type I would come out and say that I was, even if I would agree with any of these people, I would be under attack by all the other ones. And that meant, at this point, I was a discredited social figure. Nothing I said about myself would have any form of validity. No organization I affiliated myself with would allow me to come out and to gain back the trust and the respect of people who knew me online. So I stood there feeling kind of invisible and kind of lost. I decided that the best thing I could do was to just not type myself and just to proceed onwards and to focus on other projects and to move forward and hope that everything goes away. And while that happened, I thought to myself more that perhaps what I need to do is study these other systems. So what I did was I started to investigate. I went in depth. I, start, I started reading all the literature available. I read all the books once again. I studied Carl Jung's work once again. I studied objective personality, watched all their videos, uh, looked at all their content and theories. I read about cognitive personality theory and I went through and talked to all the different experts. I had long phone calls with several different people who all helpfully supported me and helping me understand myself better. And I did my own work. I started listing out all the different possibilities of my personality type, all the different types I could be, and I started going down argument by argument, every single type, what type, how would that fit, would that work, if, that, if I was that type, how would that look? I started forming a chronological history of my life, <laughs> and I wrote a kind of map detailing out, you know, everything I had experienced and learned. And I started going over argument by argument and situation by situation, memory by memory, how different types would have dealt with that situation and what type better explained my actions and my lifestyle and what led me to do what I did in those situations. What I did more than that was I started to understand and form a different understanding of personality type. Naturally, by talking to all these different organizations, I came to learn different things. I started to pick out the things that I liked about different systems. I started getting inspiration from others. I started learning and I started broadening myself. Perhaps in some ways, this past year was good for me because it brought me down to size. It made me humble. It made me know that and realize that I didn't know everything. And it made me confront myself and my own bias and my own ignorance. I read much books about bias and self-deception. For example, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. I started thinking about what kind of perception errors I might be making and what kind of subjectivity bias I might possess. I started looking at and also understanding what kind of bias other organizations might fall prone to. And I started understanding also the problem of typing. I would read through several different books, all arguing about the 16 personality types and the cognitive functions, all trying to explain how the cognitive functions were made manifest in a person, everyone trying to exemplify and describe and demonstrate what a type is, or what a type will look like. You know, every single uh, personality website will have their own definition of the INFJ or INFP or ENTP personality type. They'll try to explain in situations how different types will respond and act and what their behavior might look like and what their personality and cognition might look like. What are they going to be good at? What are they going to be bad at? What are they going to struggle with? What are their skills and what are their weaknesses? 
What I decided to do was, and this I got from the consultation of an INTJ friend, friend of mine, that was to form a map of the cognitive functions and the personality types based on their level of development. That's the context that I thought was missing. I think there is no coherent theory on how health or development might impact the personality type. Everyone is coming up with their models of how the personality types are supposed to look, but none of them are looking at what happens if a personality type grows or changes or adjusts themselves. It is as if most of these theories and this, these different systems all work with blanket personality types. Oh, there is only one kind of INFJ and all kinds of INFJs have these fears and these uh, issues and these worries and these stressors. There's only one kind of ENTP and all kinds of ENTPs are exactly the same and have and feel exact same way. There's only one explanation to these kind of statements, that's that we don't have free will. We have no choice, we have no personal say in who we are. We cannot develop ourselves, we cannot work on ourselves, we cannot improve ourselves. You are stuck the way you are, with the same fears, with the same worries, with the same anxieties, and you're always going to have those anxieties and worries. You're always going to be this unhealthy. Your personality type is your trauma, is your weakness, is your greatest flaw in life, and you're always going to have that flaw, and you're never going to be able to work through it. You might understand now why these kind of statements are damaging and unhealthy. While most of psychology today emphasizes cognitive flexibility and the ability to develop and improve yourself, most dichotomies show that it's more than possible to change your personality, to grow and to become different over time. Most show that it's possible to resolve trauma and to improve your health and to become happier and healthier if you are able to work on it and if you are able to uh, work on yourself. There is strong evidence today for epigenetics and the fact that People might even be able to change their very own DNA. Subtly, through hard work and effort, it's possible to heal and to become better and happier and to live richer lives and to feel happier and to feel more whole than what you used to. Now, seeing my life grow and seeing my own life trajectory and looking at how I had evolved and changed from my younger years to who I am today, I can say with happiness and pride that I feel as if I am a more confident, happy and healthy person today than I was as a kid growing up. I can tell how my cognition has evolved over the years and how much I have changed as a person. I can see how much I have evolved and what I have been able to work through and what my stressors and struggles used to be compared to what they are today. And I can see for myself that it is possible to become something more than what you thought you were. One reason why I struggled with the INFJ label was because the INFJ label was written for somebody in their 20s. Somebody who had just started to develop their first and second function. Somebody that maybe was starting to wrestle the third and fourth a little bit. Somebody that was struggling with overwhelm, struggling with uh, their own sense of competency and struggling with um, um, convoluted development, asynchronous development that made them help other people at the expense of the self, that made them withdraw into their own inner world of the imagination instead of putting themselves out into reality. Now, while this might have applied for me as I was younger, it certainly didn't apply to me today. What I could see was that over time, as I had exposed myself to challenges, traveled, put myself in new situations, met different people, attended events, and done public PR and communication exercises. As I had spent so much time on YouTube and putting myself out there into the world, I knew I had developed a base set of resilience that allowed me to manage my inferior function. And so I knew that I had developed the capacity to do what most INFJs can't. While most INFJs would experience a pull to withdraw from the world, at many times in their lives, while most INFJs will struggle to stay present in relationships, because other people might become too taxing on them at a time, I had found that I was able to stay present in relationships and to stay real in relationships. With time, it is more than possible for every type to develop and to become more than what they think they are. And so I have found that I too could start to wrestle the unconscious four functions of the personality type. Once you've mastered extroverted sensing, that is the key to the unconscious and to the shadow, according to Jung. And 
what I saw was that the resilience that I had brought myself up and developed in myself allowed myself to be more vulnerable. Because I had become more resilient, it was more easy for me to expose myself to the outer world. I knew that I had a base set of strength and I, that I could survive criticism, that I could handle difficulty and overwhelm. And I knew that I could handle bigger challenges. And so I was ready to start addressing the shadow functions. But you have no means, uh, no idea of how difficult it is to do shadow work, to expose yourself to the consequences of your personality, to see for firsthand that every action you has, every action you take has a consequence that is difficult. While every personnel type operates with a certain type scripts, with a certain set of beliefs and a certain set of ideas, most people don't really reflect on the consequences of their actions. Most people don't see themselves in a holistic sense. They will focus on certain aspects of their personality, things they want to see and want to know about themselves that validate their current worldview and understanding. But when you start to think about it, you start to realize that everything you do creates a whole Whenever I go out and speak, I take away from other people the chance to go out and speak. Whenever I go out and uh, try to help other people, I take away from other people their chance to help themselves. Whenever I try to do something good for the world, I take away from the world the chance to do something good for itself. To know and realize the impacts of your actions and behavior and to know that everything you do has a chain reaction or a consequence, that is something that is very tough. And so this was probably the most tough pace in my life. And the function that I found the most difficult to develop was arguably introverted feeling. Introverted feeling was uh, truly the biggest challenge because I never really liked myself and so something that I had to struggle with was that I always gave to other people at the expense of myself and I always thought that was the right thing to do because I didn't think that I was worth anything. The thing I realized was I kept relating to these kind of characters in stories that would engage in unhealthy degrees of self-sacrifice and what I saw in all these people was that they were incredibly hard on themselves. Every time they helped another person they would focus on what they failed to solve what they failed to do, what they failed to accomplish. Everyone else became their responsibility and every problem in another person's life became their problem. And if they couldn't fix or heal the world, they couldn't, they weren't worthy to be humans. They weren't good enough. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. I knew early on what my life mission was. I wanted to first and foremost explain all the mysteries of life and the world and why we're here. And I wanted, secondly, to be a mirror to the world, to help other people to see themselves. My goal was to let other people see their most true innermost version of themselves, their true core essence. My goal was to be a mirror and to help other people to see themselves in a reflection through me. I was a shapeshifter and so a person that took on the qualities of the other person and took on a role to the other person in order to help them to see themselves more clearly. My goal with every action, with every word, with everything I said, was to make sure that other people felt seen and heard. Now, over the years, I've come to accrue quite a large following of INFP supporters. INFPs are and have been the main supporter of my channel. And you know what the interesting thing is, and that is that I needed the INFPs more than I think they needed me. While they came to me for reassuring and understanding and to feel seen, for me, every time I saw an INFP, I was reminded of the fact that I was and could do good for other people and that I had a purpose and that I could uh, do something for other people that made their world a little bit better, that made their life a little bit easier. And so I was forced to recognize that I had a worth and I had a value and that the things I did, did matter. And Following that, I had to recognize that I had to give from where I had in abundance. Instead of giving to the point where I felt empty as I used to, I had to give from where I had in abundance, where I would never expire. I found in myself a well of infinite energy. I found in myself the flow state. 
I found a flow state when I was ready to give it to myself, you know, because I knew after studying it for five years what I needed to do to enter into a state of flow, but I didn't know that I had the right to it. I didn't know that I had the right to set boundaries for myself and to choose for myself what I needed in order to feel better about myself. I thought I wasn't allowed to feel flow, that I was supposed to feel stressed, that I was supposed to feel shit because I deserved it, because, you know, I wasn't the perfect YouTuber, you know, I didn't make the best videos online, I didn't uh, know every answer to every single question and I didn't have in myself the right understanding of every single concept, you know, because I didn't have perfection, I didn't have value and worth. but. When I, what I came to realize was that I had to give it to myself in order to better help other people by constantly shouldering the blame for everything that was wrong in the lives of other people, I made other people feel worse. What I thought I was doing uh, was I thought that by being hard on myself, I was able to push myself and I was able to become better. But what I found was that by being hard on myself, I was hard on other people. The friends and family members around me found it hard to be around me because whenever they were around me, they felt guilt. Guilt for how they made me feel because of their problems and because of their struggles. This made it hard for people to have friendships with me and to connect with me and it made me, it hard for me to connect with others. And I knew the impact that I was having on other people and I started to see it clearly but I didn't want to face it. So ultimately, what I had to face was that, that by giving to myself, by nurturing myself, by supporting myself, I gave myself energy and I gave myself motivation and I gave myself confidence and I gave myself comfort and that allowed me to give more to other people. The better I took care of myself, the better I was able to take care of others by maintaining and protecting my health, I was able to support myself and to support others. Now, a reason why it's so hard for people to type me is because when they look at me, they see an abundance of extroverted intuition. They see an INFJ that is capable of standing in chaos and being completely fine. And they think an INFJ can't do that. An INFJ fears chaos. That's the ultimate number one definition of an INFJ that they fear chaos. That's their Achilles heel. That's what they can never grow to endure. They will always fear chaos. Everything they do will be an act to solve and to clench and to uh, and avoid chaos. And so how could an INFJ stand in front of so many different concepts and theories and not break? Why would an INFJ choose to study all the systems, to read about all the models? Why would an INFJ choose to endure so much uncertainty and so much doubt? Because INFJs, they're supposed to want to have certainty, to know everything, to have the answer to everything. And to do so would mean for an INFJ to have to give up much of their ego. Yeah, an INFJ would have to question their very core being, would have to humble themselves immensely would have to let go of everything they thought they knew. That would be the only way for an INFJ to survive in such a situation. Yeah, that's what I did. And that's what any INFJ or INTJ can learn to do when they're ready. And so that's something I even encourage you to try to do when you're ready. First, build up the resilience to show that you're strong enough to handle being in the public spotlight. Then, develop the sense of worth to know how to take care of yourself and how to set boundaries. And when you've done that, know that you have an infinite amount of power and strength and resilience and no matter what challenges you put yourself towards or how you challenge yourself or how you what kind of problems you expose yourself to you're going to survive you're going to be all right they're going there's going to be a tomorrow and you're going to have after that a greater sense of understanding and awareness the only way for an INFJ to develop themselves and to develop their concepts is to immerse themselves in chaos and to know that they will figure it out with time, with hard work, with 
ability to be honest with yourself, it's going to work out. You're going to be okay. So this is what I encourage to all of you who are struggling with doubt about your personality type. Stop listening to people you think they know better than you and start trusting your own inner voice. Start being honest with yourself. Start being real. Start exploring different possibilities. Write down different type hypotheses and start testing them. Start allowing yourself to see yourself from a variety of perspectives. Start letting yourself have doubt, genuine doubt, and let yourself have doubt for a longer time. And trust that you'll figure out the answer. Trust that the answer is going to come to you someday, that you're going to know that you're going to figure it out. I've always said that objective personality does the world a disservice with its typing program. The labels it assigns to you, the way it types you, it risks doing more harm than good. The problem is that any form of self-understanding has to come from the self. They can tell you the right answer, and if you don't understand it, you might as well have not known it to begin with. This is why a lot of gurus will never answer questions directly. People like uh, Sadhguru and others, what you'll notice is whenever they're asked, who am I? They go back, why are you asking me that? You know, <laughs> you know that uh, you need to ask yourself that you need to, you shouldn't be asking me that. You know, that's that's the basis of a healthy typing program, I think, to be able to create the space for another person to hear themselves and to hear their own voice, to present for people what they need exactly what they need in that situation to get further on their trip to figure out their personality type and who they are and a space for them to be honest and to be real and I can tell you what type you are but ultimately you're gonna have to figure it out yourself I think one reason why people mistype me is because they have the wrong idea about me and my lifestyle first Let's go down the hours, let's talk about the hours, let's get down to the facts of the matter. I live on a steady schedule. That means I go to bed at 9 and I wake up around half 7. I sleep 8 hours every day, on average. I have no set schedule, but I always naturally found my rhythm. I always go to sleep around the same time and I always wake up around the same time and I never need to have an alarm. When I start my mornings, I start slow. I start by listening to calm, cozy music, having a cup of coffee. I will often go downstairs and I'll sit in the sun and enjoy the dawn of the new day. I'll engage in reading. I'll sit and think. I'll do things slowly and I'll start slowly. And then, when I have the energy, I'll start getting to work. I'll start ideally by writing. Writing is the most fun. I'll write for hours a day. I read for hours a day and I write for hours a day. And then I have a full-time job. I work 40 hours a week developing websites. I try to avoid meetings. I try to just focus on my work. I want to have an undisturbed and focused workplace. I take a lot of breaks. I often go for walks. I'll go on a lunch walk for an hour across the lake, I'll sit by the water and I'll relax. At the end of the day, I often like to go on a second walk. <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of walking. I like to walk. I like to be in nature. I like to sit down in nature and read. I often bring my book with me and I'll sit somewhere and I'll read. Or I'll bring a keyboard and phone with me and I'll start to write. It all depends on what I'm in the mood for. I often like to call with people. I have lots of phone calls. I'm often having discussions with people about life, about things I'm reading, books I've found, intellectual concepts. I'm often very attuned to people. I love people. People are amazing and uh, I feel a strong sense of connection to other. And then I start to slow down. I don't work much in the late hours unless I have an appointment. I prefer when I can just relax and slow down. I don't like to work past 7. I like to take it easy and to use that time to clear my head and to formulate my thoughts. Perhaps I'll read, 
but that depends on how I'm feeling. Sometimes I get to the point where I'm reading and it's like I'm trying to cram my brain open, you know, and push things in, even if I don't, I can't take it in anymore, you know. Um, I get overwhelmed. I read 10 books a month on average at the moment. Uh, and I have to constantly manage overwhelm and set boundaries to myself and to think about what I can do and what's important to me in the moment. I live a pretty spontaneous lifestyle. Flow is like that. Flow is free. And so that means every day is a new day and every minute I have a different thing I want to do. And I don't force anything. I don't force myself to work if I don't have the attention. I don't force myself to write if I can't get the creativity. I don't force myself to read if I can't fit it in my head. I just do what I feel like. And so something important for me is to tune out. I don't watch TV. I don't own a TV. I rarely go to the movies. I rarely spend time on social media and except to talk to other people. I don't browse or scroll. (laughs) It doesn't give anything to me. It doesn't do anything for me. I watch a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I watch a lot of videos, often from people that inspire me. And yeah, that's my life. Now, probably you'll come out of this thinking I'm a completely different type and probably you're still not going to agree with me and probably you're still going to have your different opinion on me. And I think that's fine. You're free to have your opinion on me and I'm free to have mine. And I think what you want to have is a level of or a degree of humility that you can never really know what's going on in another person's head. You can't claim to know better than another person what they know about themselves. You have to have a base level of respect for other people and their process and their way of finding their type. You have to understand that everyone has their path and their way of doing things. We shouldn't be so stereotypical in our approach to typology that we think that we can use shallow, superficial, visual signals or body language to type another person. The fact is... These voltological systems out there that practice face typing, they change every three, six months, you know. I've had cognitive type list me as like five or six different personality types over the years. They change their mind every single time. They come up with a system and the system falls apart over and over again and has to be reformulated. They try, uh, but everything they do has its own bias. Every set of parameters they come up with, every explanation or definition they assign will fall apart on its own merit over time as they have to extend past maybe 20 or 50 reads. You know, no system can survive complexity of human nature. It might be possible to demonstrate a voltological system for maybe 20 or 100 celebrities, but when you start getting past that number, it becomes increasingly difficult. Their amount of errors and contradictions just start to accrue and eventually it becomes too much to ignore. Similarly, objective personality claims to have a pretty wide library of celebrities that they've typed in the same types. But what they're going to find is they don't even release 99% of the people they say they have typed. And there is a reason for this. And it's because they don't trust themselves on these people. They know that they're seeing things that they can't explain. They know that these things don't make sense. And they focus on showing only the most superficial and obvious examples. Only the people that fit within their parameters are given a place in the public spotlight. And anybody that doesn't fit is hid away from it. Now, I think any person who believes in the scientific process should believe in transparency. And that is show your numbers, show your figures, show your examples, not just your good examples but also the examples that don't work. I'd also say, if you're trying to formulate an understanding of type, you need to account for cognitive development. If you can't see how a type can change over time, you're going to get lost. You need to understand what can be the difference between a developed and an undeveloped version of any personnel type and a healthy version versus a healthy version of any personnel type. And if you can't see that, Well, your type system is only going to work on a set number of people and it's going to break after that. So here's my type video unboxing. I'm an INFJ. Take it or leave it. 
Have a nice day and feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and have a nice day.